Doug Paul. Thank you. I'm Doug Paul from Carnegie Endowment in Washington. Um, I want to thank the organizers for arranging the conference version of the Farewell Symphony of Haydn, where one by one the performers leave before the piece is over. <laughs> um, I, I want to first pay tribute to uh, Governor Narayanan's uh, insight and wisdom on the big picture of security in China. In the great tradition of Indian diplomats like Sham Saran and, and uh, Shiv Shankar Menon and now Vijay Gokhale in Beijing, that's a, a very important statement. But I want to ask two somewhat related questions. Throughout the discussion of North Korea, no one has mentioned containment or deter deterrence. Um, some have talked about comprehensive, uh, verifiable, irreversible destruction of the nuclear capabilities, but that seems to be very far away. And people don't want to intrude with violence. Uh, so we may be living with containment and deterrence a long time. Can we do that for 35 years or whatever the life expectancy of Kim Jong-un is likely to be? And secondly, and a little bit more provocatively, if you go to the White House and ask people in the current administration about the erratic statements of President Trump and his kind of saber-rattling characterizations in 144 characters, um, they'll say, have you noticed that he has intimidated China into taking more steps to constrain the flow of assistance to North Korea? Have you noticed that since he made his threats, there have been no more ICBM tests or nuclear tests? Uh, maybe his methods have a way of working. How do you respond to that? Very good, yes. Uh, I'm uh, Renaud Girard, I'm the um, Foreign Affairs uh, columnist of Le Figaro, which is a French daily. Um, I would like to, I mean, the main danger in Asia is two rising powers, China and America. Um, I would like to know, because the situation in the current peninsula will not change. I mean, uh, China obviously doesn't want uh, reunification of uh, Korea. Even in South Korea, I don't think that the youth wants to uh, reunification with North Korea, maybe the old people, but not the youth. Uh, Japan, I think, doesn't say anything about that, but I don't think that Japan wants the reunification of, uh, of Korea, so I don't think that uh, the, there will be any change and you have a, a dictator who doesn't want to end like Gaddafi or Saddam Hussein and who tries to protect himself. Um, but the, um, but there's these two big rising powers, but the rising power uh, which is China and the last power is America. Uh, I would like to know what is exactly the role that China assigns to the US in Pacific. What are they ready, what China is ready to accept as an American presence in the Pacific, in Asia? That's the question of a man who asks questions for a living. Um, any other questions before I turn to the panel? Okay, so who would like to go first? Sure, Yusuf. Well, the first is Doc's uh, uh, question. I think the containment and deterrence I would like to leave to the, the experts of, of the North, uh, of the Korean Peninsula. But uh, what shall I say to the question when somebody asks, he has achieved a lot with all this bull, uh, BS, sorry, uh, you know? And, and, and so what, what do you, so how do you respond to that? Well, my response is that it's also a question mark whether he has achieved it because of his rhetorics. For me, it's a question mark because this King Jong-un is not a dummy too, you know? And therefore, I don't think it is now, you know, 
uh, uh, relevant to, uh, ask, to ask the question whether this rhetoric that confuses things a lot in the meantime is really critical for the containment and deterrence that you mentioned, Mindy. Well, I don't believe that, to be frank with you. Number two, but that it, of course, Chan Chi Guo really uh, uh, answering it as, 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 as a scholar, uh, of a Chinese scholar. But what I have picked up, you know, on, on the, the road, that road that China would like to give to the United States is that East Asia is big enough for both of them to cooperate and to survive. They don't want some of the things, and you know which one, such as spying along their coast, etc. They don't like that, and they are opposed to that. And they are, of course, in the long term, preparing themselves for the eventuality, according to me, that there will be a confrontation with the United States one day. But for the time being, first they know that they are not ready completely to take over. Second, also they know that you know, there are still a lot to be done that they can do together. That is my observation from the outside on what China thinks at this stage, for the next 10 years at least, you know, on the role of the United States. Jingho, maybe you can add because you know better. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the first question is uh, whether deterrence and containment strategy uh, can be used. Uh, well, I think from the American perspective, it can be used. Okay. Actually, you can erect a missile defense uh, system in the middle of the Pacific and protect yourself. Uh, but the problem is, uh, even from the American perspective, it can pose a serious problem. Uh, first, what about the eastern part of, uh, I mean, the, the Pacific part of the uh, US? Uh, it cannot be protected uh, by some kind of a missile defense arrangement. And also, what about the military alliances you have? Uh, American uh, allies, Japan and South Korea especially, are not going to be happy with that because they don't have a viable deterrence uh, capability to, 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 to do that. And China is not happy <laughs> because China has, is next to uh, South Korea. <laughs> no uh, deterrence, uh, I mean, no um, defense, uh, uh, missile defense arrangement can, can protect China. And also, there is a more serious problem that is uh, proliferation uh, regime is going to be down the drain. Okay. Oh, non-proliferation regime is going to be down the drain. Okay. So um, it's a it's a problem, a uh, uh, big challenge uh, for all of us. Uh, uh, Trump's policy uh, on North Korea or oh, on China to make China to push for push North Korea is that working? Uh, to some extent, it's working, uh, but at the same time, I think uh, it works because China is China's position is moving in that direction. Okay. I remember. Well, I, I think China's the discourse on North Korea in China uh, policy uh, discourse has moved over time from how much we should help North Korea to whether we should help North Korea, to uh, how much we should push North Korea uh, nowadays. Okay. So you know, given this contest, uh, it's not a surprise that uh, she is more uh, you know, uh, res responsive to uh, Trump's pressures. And finally, uh, reunification of, uh, I mean, what's the role of the U.S. Uh, in the Pacific, in the Asia, in this region for China, uh, what's the ideal role? <laughs> I don't know what what's the uh, what the ideal role is, but uh, I think China on the rise uh, poses a serious problem for China as well. Uh, that is, it's very difficult to define its interests, to know what really wants. Okay, 
China is both a developing country and a developed country at the same time. It's a rich country and poor country at the same time. It's a strong country and weak country at the same time. It's an ordinary country and a superpower at the same time. And its interests are in conflict. Uh, so it's very difficult for China to figure out what it wants uh, at, this good, at this moment uh, of transition. So uh, that, to some extent, affects our view of what the proper role of the US in, the Pacific, in, the, in this part of the world. Uh, sometimes we want the US to stay and to play a larger role, uh, especially when it comes to make sure that uh, Japan will not become remilitarized, and also to maintain the security order in the region. Uh, but sometimes we find the, the U.S. presence uh, a nuisance. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, uh, the U.S. military uh, tried to stop China from doing this and doing that and threatened to, to uh, uh, you know, issue threats against China. Um, so, uh, I don't know, you know, China also finds itself exclu excluded from the these uh, military alliances. So it's like it's the other party, uh, not one of us. So uh, I think this creates, uh, this, this alienates China. So uh, I think uh, the, it will take some time for China to, to develop a, 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 a more uh, clear uh, uh, you know, view as to what kind of role uh, uh, is proper for the U.S. to play in the region. Let me stop here. Well, uh, yeah, I think uh, officers, uh, you know, retreated and uh, poor soldiers uh, standing in the front, I mean, you know, for the barrage of <laughs> uh, difficult questions. But nevertheless, well, uh, I like uh, Doug Paul uh, for the question. Uh, out of his... Uh, maybe uh, disappointment, I mean, in dealing with North Korea. Uh, well, we, we put our hands on this issue when we were in Washington together. So, uh, well, Doug has been very much disappointed, tired uh, of North Korea's brinkmanship. Well, so I'm glad he uh, raised this question and uh, put up his uh, wisdom uh, to uh, deal with North Korea, uh, you know, by the means of containment and deterrence. Well, I spent, uh, you know, most of my uh, diplomatic career uh, struggling with this issue, and uh, uh, I got retired without seeing the result, uh, resolution of this issue, but my mind is always on this issue. Uh, well, when I uh, dealt with North Korea, uh, I thought we could realize some bargaining, um, and uh, even we could buy a North Korean nuclear program uh, with the cash. And, uh, but I think I was mistaken, and uh, I don't think anymore uh, we can uh, deal with North Korean nuclear program with providing uh, economic uh, assistance or cash. Well, um, so uh, if we try to resolve this issue in a short period of time, then uh, we are, you know, we tend to make uh, similar mistakes. So I think we have to have enough time uh, to to do something. I mean, for uh, this issue. So um, you know, containment and the strengthen the sanctions uh, by the UN, by the international community, is the right track. So they feel pains. I mean, you know, uh, well, uh, the past sanctions or, you know, UN uh, statement was uh, peanut. I mean, it didn't work. So North Korea thought very lightly of any actions taken by the UN at that time. But now different. I mean, this issue was among the countries concerned in the region, now it has become the global security issue. So I'm glad that uh, we take up this issue in this uh, 
World Policy Conference. Uh, so it will take you know longer time, and uh, I think a containment plus deterrence, military deterrence, extended deterrence provided by the U.S. I think will take effect. Well, uh, about China's role toward North Korea. Well, uh, Professor Jia, you know, uh, he explained. I mean. Uh, the attitude changed, I mean, uh, you know, from, uh, well, uh, the past, I mean, uh, uh, Chinese always thought how to help North Korea, you know, overcoming these difficulties, issues, but now uh, they think whether they should do that or not. But I have some different opinion, you know, well, uh, we, as you know, uh, we introduced the third system, defend uh, the uh, U.S. military, I mean, stationed in Korea, and uh, we thought it was necessary to defend uh, ourselves as well as uh, the U.S. forces. But because of that, I mean, China punished South Korea, and they severed all, uh, you know, normal and regular relations for about one year. During the time, Korean business, I mean, you know, inflicted a lot of loss. I mean, uh, uh, even Lotte Business Group, they closed down their retail uh, sector uh, operating in, in China. And the Hyundai cars, their sales cut back half. So, I mean, uh, the amount of uh, Korean businesses loss amounted to maybe billions of dollars. So, well, I'm glad that uh, recently uh, we we, you know, uh, China and Korea uh, made agreement, I mean, to, to finish uh, this awkward, I mean, situation. So uh, we will return to the normal uh, good relations. So, uh, it, well, why China punished South Korea instead of North Korea when we took our self-defense measure? So that is my question mark, but uh, I will stop here. On an entirely different topic, because we're about to run out of time. No, I just, I just wanted to explain okay, a point. Well, then it's over. Because everybody talks about North Korea, but I thought the, because the China in Asia is a bigger issue than, than North Korea. Exactly. And I think it, it, has, it, it has implications for the world at large. I mean, I think from, from the rest of Asia, the view is that China is the rising power today. And China is not masking its ambitions. The other transformative is that the United States is seen as a status quo power. I don't, I don't want to use the word receding power. It has implications across the region. Take India, for instance. We, we, we have no basic conflict, in it, but there is, a, there is an, a, what I call a civilization conflict between these two nations. We have now developed much closer relations with Japan, and, and I think one reason is the rise of China kind of thing. It's not that we anticipate that China is going to attack anyone, but then impression. Now, the United States, the pivot to Asia is completely gone. So all nations are adjusting their priorities. I think the rise of China is the most dominant aspect of politics, at least as far as Asia is concerned. I'm not saying China is going out of its way to prove it, but, but it is a fact. And therefore, there was, for a long, the United States had pressed for a quadrilateral between the United States, Japan, Australia, and India. India had been, India is now a shifting stance to some extent. It has softened its approach towards this. It's all a part of the thing. So the rise of China, the, and I don't know when to use the word, weakness of the United States, is having a very major uh, sort of impact on the way nations are adjusting their priorities and their situations. And I think how this term, uh, plays out is going to be what is the future for the next five years in kind of, between the 19th and the 20th party Congress. And President Xi certainly gives an impression that he's not merely in command of China, but he wishes to be in command of a lot greater, greater area. So I think we have to be careful. And I, I'm taking it not merely looking at the North Korean angle, I'm looking at the entire point, whether it's Southeast Asia, East Asia, Etc. And China has now moved. It's now it's a major factor in West Asia also. 
China and Russia have become major, major factors in the West Asian situation. So all this makes China a rising power. I don't say necessarily it's a, it's a wrong, wrong thing, but it is a factor. And it has an impact on almost all nations, certainly even a country like India. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think that wraps up this panel.